In a Substack article that you wrote recently about culture, um, you mentioned that uh, many traditional data management tools are reactive rather than preventative. And so uh, I'm going to use this Substack article as a jumping off point into Gable, your company. So how does Gable, your company's approach to data contracts, shift this paradigm um, so that we're, yeah, no longer being reactive um, uh, and, and we are now starting to become preventative with tools like Gable. Um, yeah, how does that work? Yeah, so uh, there's a there's a new paradigm in data management and data quality and data governance that's been kind of bubbling within the under the surface for the past couple of years or so called shift left. And uh, this did not start in data actually. It started in the security space. And what security engineers realized maybe five seven years ago was that the only way to prevent security incidents and hacking and fraud and so on and so forth was to shift all of the security management best practices into the actual code base where the software engineers were doing their daily work. Otherwise, security was always going to be an afterthought to the application teams who are writing code and the security teams could only respond reactively to when they were hacked or when they did detect the data quality issue or a, a security issue had, had occurred. And data, I think, is following very closely behind security in the same way. Um, data quality issues are not something that data producers are, are thinking about actively. And that's because the data that a producer is creating is normally used for a very different reason than what a data scientist is using it for. So if I'm a software engineer and I own a operational database, I'm using that operational database to run my service to run the app. But that data, like it could be customer data, it could be uh, purchase data or item data, becomes incredibly useful for, for training machine learning models, for, for doing analytics and so on and so forth. And so the question is, how do you get a, a software engineer who is not thinking about machine learning in their day-to-day -day job to start taking it seriously? And the only real way to do it is to push the requirements of data quality and data governance into their development workflow. Um, so like I said, this, this is what security is doing, and this is what Gable is starting to do for the data management and the data quality space. Seamlessly check for data quality issues, data governance issues, when data producers are writing code, committing code, uh, generating PRs, and helping the teams who use that data understand the changes that are coming before they manifest into a production environment. So to just give you a quick example, I mentioned that, you know, um, you might have a, a software engineer who decides to change a timestamp column from local time to UTC. What Gable can do is we can check that code before it's actually deployed into production and say, we know that John, the data scientist downstream, is using that local time data in their machine learning model. And we can provide that feedback to the software engineer, hey, wait a second, there's a machine learning model that is dependent on this data. You shouldn't make this change until you talk to John. And at the same time, we can give John information that says, hey, there's a change that's coming that's going to impact you. Now is your opportunity to either get in front of it and have a conversation with the person who's deploying that change or update your training data so you don't get broken. That's the core of what we do. Nice, nice. This idea of shifting left, I feel like is something that we need to dig into in more detail. It isn't something that I'd come across before uh, looking into you and Gable. So, I mean, this is the mission of Gable is this idea of emphasizing shifting data quality, data governance, data management left. <laughs> so what is that? Where What is this continuum that goes from left to right that we're shifting left on? Yeah. So if you think about a normal data pipeline or your average data pipeline, right? You've got some, it, let's just talk about internal to a business for now. So it's simple. Um, you've got some application code, some software engineer, maybe a front end engineer who's writing events. You know, every time a user logs in, we collect some user data, we update a database. So data flows to a database once a user actually interacts with a website. And from the website uh, or from the database, we're now pushing that data usually into some storage environment. We might be doing that through in, in batch. We might be doing it through a streaming system like Kafka. So maybe it flows through a Kafka topic into S3. It lands in a, in a file like a CSV or a Parquet file. And then from there, you've got your, your data platform team in most large companies. 
that are picking that data up and they are moving it into the analytical database like a Snowflake or a BigQuery or they might be using a Databricks or something like that. And then once it hits the analytical database, then you've got data modeling tools that are used like uh, DBT. You've got orchestration tools like Airflow that are responsible for sort of shuttling the data around. And you might have multiple different data models and multiple different transformations, you know, one, two, three, four, you know, five, all the way up to, to 10 or, or, or maybe even more than that before the data ultimately arrives to a consumer who can actually use it. And then after that, you've got the actual data product. So you've got the, the data asset that is delivering some value for the business. And that might be the, the training set for your model. It might be the, the dashboard. It might be the report, right? So you have this really sort of long, complex uh, chain of technologies and people that are handing data off all along the way. And you can see what sort of problems could be caused just by lack of communication if someone at one point in the chain decides to do something that doesn't you know, jive with someone else at, at another point in the chain. So when we're talking about shifting left, what we're saying is we're taking the responsibility that usually comes from the data engineers and the data scientists and the data platform teams once the data arrives in an analytical ecosystem and applying the governance there and starting to move it closer and closer and closer to the person who's actually producing the data. And that gets you that full end-to-end -end, uh, coverage for data quality. Makes perfect sense. I get it. And I feel like I maybe should have got it before you even explained it now that you have. But yeah, this idea of yeah information flows when we write it out, we typically have them running from left to right. And so the idea here is that you're shifting data quality, data governance, data management left towards the data producers and further from the data consumers. Nice. Yeah. And That's then right. so it's, it seems crystal clear when you do that, how that can foster visibility, accountability, ownership, and all those key things. Um, trust. One of the interesting things, it, it, exactly. One of the interesting things is that in, in the data world, we're actually pretty late to this concept. It's been around for a really long time in other areas like QA, for example. So, you know, it, I, I don't know sort of uh, what, what the average age of your listeners are, but if you've been in tech for a very long time, you probably have worked for a company that had a dedicated QA team. And that's really all they did is they checked the code that some software engineer has written to make sure it doesn't have any bugs. But if you're working at a more modern startup or just a more modern company, you probably don't see that as much. The teams responsible for doing the QA are the software engineers who are actually building the application. So QA has effectively shifted left, same for version control and infrastructure monitoring and so on and so forth. And the reason why that happened, I think, is, is, is pretty obvious. But, you know, the, if, if you have a centralized team and all that centralized team is responsible for is quality, you're effectively like putting them in uh, almost putting them in competition with the teams who are responsible for shipping code and delivering value for the business. And who's going to win if the, the quality team who says, hey, you, you've got a lot of problems, you've got issues with your code, you need to fix them. Or the team that's shipping that code and saying, hey, if I ship this, we're going to make a whole lot of money. Well, it's obviously the team who makes the money is, is almost always going to take priority. And what that's resulted in over time is just a bunch of low quality code that creates a ton of tech debt, a ton of data debt, and so on and so forth. And so these folks have sort of realized, well, we, we need to actually, if we want to have high quality code, if we want to have sustainable infrastructure, then the teams who are making the money also need to be the teams that are thinking about quality.